I think we're in need of a little light relief, don't you, after the events of the last ten days or so. And um, I mean, it, it's been it's been an incredible ten days, but there there is a time when you think, well, we need to do something a little bit different. So that's why we've resurrected the LBC Book Club this evening. Delighted to welcome my two authors into the studio. Um, let me tell you who they are. And introduce them. Richard J. Aldrich has written a book called GCHQ: The Uncensored Story of Britain's Most Secret Intelligence Agency. I'm not quite sure that qualifies as light relief, but you know where I'm coming from on that. And also, Richard, good evening. Good evening. And also with me is Jeremy Nicholas, the author of Mr Moon Has Left the Stadium, Confessions of a Match Day Announcer. Welcome, Jeremy. Evening, Ian. Now, um, I, I have to um, say that Jeremy stepped in because uh, the other author that we were supposed to have tonight cancelled at very short notice. And I should, in all transparency, admit that I am the publisher of this book. So I, I always do that if I'm the publisher, just so people can't ever accuse me of... I don't know, hiding my light under a bush or not. It's, that, it's not interesting that, that you've worked. actually announced a substitution, and usually it's me that does that. But this is very true, yeah. because Jeremy is the match day announcer at West Ham United Football Club. Um, any of you that ever go to Upton Park, you will have heard his voice before. And um, he's also a radio broadcaster, so you probably heard his voice anyway. Now, um, I want to start off with um, Richard's book, GCHQ, The Uncensored Story of Britain's Most Secret Intelligence Agency. And if you have a question for either of my authors, by the way, the number is 0845 6060 973. For those who don't know Richard, just explain what GCHQ actually is and does. Bletchley Park, Ble oh, sorry, GCHQ is the continuation of Bletchley Park. The people who worked at Bletchley C Park broke German codes, broke the codes produced by the Enigma machine, produced war-winning intelligence, and we know that story. But actually what most people don't know about is that those people continued to work on after 1945, and they're still doing that job today, listening in on our enemies and providing priceless intelligence. What does it stand for? It stands for Government Communications Headquarters, and really they chose that name because it sounded innocuous. It didn't say spying or intelligence. <laughs> they wanted to cover up what they were doing. And, and who's it governed by? I mean, which government department it's owned, it? It's owned by the Foreign Office, but what we discovered in researching the book was actually, for most of the Cold War, GCHQ was actually bigger than the Foreign Office. It's a huge organisation, but but very subterranean. Because, I mean, the first time I came across it was back in the 1980s when Geoffrey Howe, who was Foreign Secretary, then wanted to withdraw trade union rights. Right? And, and I suspect that even now most people wouldn't have a clue what it means. It, it was the trade union dispute that brought it to public attention. It was, it was quite funny, really, because Margaret Thatcher was obsessive about secrecy, but her attempts to ban the trade unions there actually put it on the front page of every every British newspaper. And so what are its functions in a nutshell? Well, I, I guess what it's most famous for is this, is this code-breaking stuff, listening in on our enemies. But actually, the even more secret part of um, GCHQ um, looks after the protection of British code, so tries to stop um, enemies listening in on us and more recently stops people like the Chinese attacking the internet. And what, what's really interesting is that perhaps 10 years ago, all of GCHQ's work was secret, but actually, as we've become more and more dependent on the internet and electronic infrastructure, actually they've had to come out of the shadows mm. and engage with British banks and people like that and help protect the internet. Um, and, and actually, of course, we all use electronic communications. This has become an issue during the recent riots, of course, with, with David Cameron talking about blackberry and instant messaging so this is now in all our lives it was it was something that was very secret but now it touches all of us i suppose since it was I mean, when was it actually created um essentially gchq was was it had a funny name immediately after the war but essentially it's 1945 right. 1946 and i suppose there have been different era, eras in its development i mean clearly i suppose the first 20 30 40 years was was almost dominated by the cold war absolutely i mean what what's what, what's remarkable i think is that we tend to think of bletchley park gchq as kind of pipe smoking boffins sitting over computers doing maths but actually to collect this secret code breaking intelligence you often had to get quite close to the russians so we were sending submarines into russian harbors the russians were depth charging on submarines so actually some of this code breaking stuff was really quite kind of james bond quite edgy really quite dangerous mm. jeremy is this the sort of book that you would normally have by your bedside table yeah it would actually i had a girlfriend once really and uh, <laughs> yes that's the that's the curious thing only only once uh, and her dad i think 
might have worked for GCHQ. It's all a little bit secret, because presumably you don't say if you work there, do you? No, it's, it's no. top, top secret. Yeah. And, uh, but he was, he was uh, fantastic at languages, and he would just be given little bits of things to translate without necessarily knowing what the whole thing was. Would that be likely that he definitely uh, did that? Uh, absolutely. And, I mean, one remarkable story was of a, a young woman in her mid-twenties who was recruited into GCHQ because she had exotic languages like Indonesian. It was only when she started work at GCHQ that she realised both her mother and her father were also working there. <laughs> Do you think, just... if, if there are people listening and they, they have members of the family uh, that are good at crosswords and are good at languages, that the chances are at some point they might have worked for GCHQ? It's, it's quite likely. It's yeah. quite likely. If, if they are in your family, then ring now and, and grasp them <laughs> up. <laughs> oh, 0845 <laughs> 6060 You can tell he's a broadcaster, can't you? Um, now, you've, you've got a, a section of the book titled 1950s, Fighting the Electronic War. And I suppose that was really the, the first time that electronic wars were really fought. Well, it's it's something that comes on stream, I suppose, to some extent during the Second World War. We, we know, for example, the Germans used to guide their bombers by by using these strange electronic pathways, and and, and, and so, so some of this begins to emerge at the end of the at the end of the Second World War. But yes, the Cold War is very much an electronic war, and um, it's it, 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 it is, and it's it's not wrong to call it a war. I mean. There's a war going on between the various embassies. I mean, for example, the British embassy in Moscow is is raided by the KGB. They they um the the the, the KGB start a little fire in in the British embassy, um, and round the corner are twelve KGB guys dressed up in ill-fitting firemen's uniforms. And before anyone's rung the fire brigade, this fire engine turns up at the front door. And what they're trying to do is break their way into the code room. They're trying to get at the electronic crown jewels, if you like, in in the British embassy. So it is a war. It does. The, the British codebreakers, by the way, barricaded the door and kept the KGB out. But it was fisticuffs. It was, if you like, a mm. real physical battle. What, what fascinates me with books like yours and, and others that are about in espionage, intelligence, how on earth do you get the information? Because this wasn't sanctioned by GCHQ, No, no, it, was it wasn't. It? And, and actually, it all began um, about 10 years ago when some of my friends were were putting together a little bu a book to try and raise money to to preserve the huts at Bletchley Park, these these wooden huts where the code breaking was done during the war, and 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 they asked me to write a little bit for the back of the book about how Bletchley Park became GCHQ, and I, I said I'll, I'll do that because there's no information, and I went down to the archives, and lo and behold, although GCHQ has not released its files, all the other government departments that work with GCHQ, so you know the Air Force, the Cabinet Office had all released files on GCHQ, and they were actually two days turned into two weeks, turned into time. I'm still going. I haven't quite finished. Turn, <laughs> turned into 650 yes. pages. Yes, yes. Cause Cause it's not a thin book, this, is it? Some of this stuff, I think, was released by accident. Really? Um, it, not, not well, that, that, that inspires confidence, doesn't it? <laughs> I think the thing we all want to know is, though, were the huts saved? What did you manage to save them? The, the huts are saved, and they're fantastic, and, and they're, 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 they're there in, in Bletchley just outside... Uh, Milton Keynes, and a really good day out for anybody who wants to go and visit them. Um, here's a question on Twitter for you, Richard. Uh, we don't normally get questions on Twitter in this hour, so uh, consider yourself privileged. Can you ask Richard how GCHQ will overcome the brightest talents joining Google, Facebook, etc., because the state can't pay the same as these organisations? I mean, this, 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 is, this is a huge problem um, because... Um, GCHQ is competing with the big giants, the Googles, the Microsofts for salaries. But it also reminds us that actually it's not just government that keeps information on us. It's not Big Brother, it's lots of Little Brothers. I think mm. Tesco probably has more information on me than the Home Office, which is probably good because I probably trust Tesco more than the, the Home Office. But it's, 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 <laughs> it's, all these, it's all this kind of self-surveillance. You know, we, we have a loyalty card, we tell everybody what we buy. Um, that's actually the new face of spying. It's, it's not sort of James Bond, it's Tesco. That, that's frightening in itself, isn't it? I, I shall... If I had a club card, I would destroy it immediately. <laughs> I would definitely barricade my doors if I thought Tesco were going to do a little raid on me. <laughs> I don't like the idea of those Russians coming around the embassy nicking our Ferrero Rocher. You've, you've mentioned um, something about the British Embassy in Moscow. I've got a section here titled Embassy Wars. And, I mean, there, there, is, there are rules and regulations and etiquette about um, how you deal with, with foreign embassies, aren't there? Do, how regularly are these rules transgressed? Oh, they're, they're transgressed all the time. But, but I think the, the, the British were, were extremely smart in how they 
protected their embassies. And the last line of defence, if you wanted to have a, a secret conversation in your embassy and you didn't want the Russians bugging your meeting, what they had were four disco-sized loudspeakers in our embassy in East Berlin. And each loudspeaker would play a different episode of The Archers. And where the four episodes of The Archers came together in the middle of the room, there was such cacophony and confusion that you could have your meeting and you could be confident the KGB couldn't work out what was going on. The problem was you could, probably couldn't hear yourself think either. Because that must be a nightmare when, you, when you're in the middle of a, a, a very important summit. I mean, say, Reagan, Gorbachev, Thatcher, those kind of summits. I mean, I, I think they, they had, certainly the American embassy would, would, would have soundproof sort of um, tents or something in, yep. in the middle of their embassies, wouldn't they? So they could try and be sure that the Russians couldn't listen in. Yep, they have these plastic tents suspended by little wires and they'd have they'd have music playing in the background but of course this is this is incredibly oppressive i mean Macmillan goes to moscow in 1959 he says it's terrible i can't talk to anybody if i have a conversation i have to get in this stupid plastic tent and the gramophone record plays in the corner it's quite oppressive and of course if you're the british ambassador in moscow you live in this goldfish bowl for three years with, 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 with every word being listened in on. So what about all the foreign embassies in London, you know, just within a few square miles of where we are now? Are we bugging them? Absolutely. All it of would them. be rude not to. Even, the, to. even like the friendly ones? Even the French. I think so, even the French. <laughs> especially the French. <laughs> Ian Smith, the Rhodesian leader, used to insist on having his top secret meetings when he was over here in the ladies' lavatory because he was convinced that the British wouldn't stoop so low as to bug the ladies' lavatory. I bet that's just a story that came up because he got caught in there or something. <laughs> g g give me another couple of embassy anecdotes from the book. Well, I, th I think, you know, w w w what I love is the British... We, we didn't recognise... Um, and we were just chatting about this this, 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 this before we came on. We, we, we didn't actually recognise East Germany until 1973. Before then, we used to have to chase round the, the East German football team to make sure they only described them. So they came to Britain. They had to be described as the, the, the football team from the Soviet-occupied zone of Germany. But in 1973, we finally recognised... What a chant that was. <laughs> <laughs> we finally... I don't know how many fans were allowed to come over and support, but... Um, or how many went back if they did. But, but anyway, we were trying to set up, a, we had, when we recognised in 1973, we had to set up, um, a new, um, a, a, an embassy, of course. And, uh, the main factor was to choose a, a building that we thought would be difficult to bug. And our technicians thought they'd found one. But on, on, unfortunately, the ground floor was a lingerie shop. And the ambassador said, oh, I'm not sure I really, not really dignified to have a British embassy over a lingerie shop. But sure enough, they, they, they built their embassy there. And, of course, they, they went through the building looking in every nook and cranny for bugs. And when the, the embassy was finally open, the, the ambassador had to go round to the East Germans and present his credentials. And there was him and a couple of other chaps going, the last minute, they decided not to take a party of three. They'd take a party of five. It would be a bit more prestigious. And when they arrived in the East German Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there were already five coffee cups waiting for them. <laughs> and they, they realised that their efforts to eliminate the bugs had not well, been entirely successful. you're listening to The Book Club on LBC 97.3. The time now is 9.16. And here's Alan Joyce with the LBC Travel. Thanks, Ian. And Lee Bridge Road in Clapton has been closed tonight. All now. Well, it's 20 past nine. You're listening to the LBC Book Club with me, Ian Dale, and with me in the studio are Richard J. Aldrich, the author of GCHQ, The Uncensored Story of Britain's Most Secret Intelligence Agency, and M Jeremy Nicholas, who's written a book called Mr. Moon Has Left the Stadium, Confessions of a Match Day Announcer. They're both in paperback. They're both £12.99, 0845 if you'd like to ask either of them a question. Now, Jeremy, you are the Match Day Announcer at West Ham. What on earth possessed you to write a book about your experiences well um it's a funny book about football and uh, be being a west ham fan you have to have a sense of humor as you know because <laughs> we do have for a, those of you who don't know i am a west ham season you, ticket holder you are yeah it's, it's all over your face i can see all the lines of worry and there's just lots of humorous behind the scenes stories that have come out and over the years i've, I've been the announcer now uh, this is my 14th season and i've collected loads of, sort of funny stories of things that have happened i thought i'll set them down cheer us all up <laughs> we've been relegated let's have a laugh <laughs> yeah well you say confessions of a match day announcer yes. um which indicates that the, uh, some, on some occasions maybe um things haven't gone quite as you had planned Yes, I'm not sure about that confessions. It does sound sort of like a, a, a 70s... <laughs> well, I mean, the, the movie, interesting thing it? about the book is that, yes, it is about your experiences at West Ham, but you, you quite cleverly weave in quite a lot about your personal life, about your, your broadcasting career as well. Yes. 
Um, yeah. And it's sort of, it, I mean, it's a bit of a memoir, isn't it, really? It is, yeah, it's sort of part autobiography, part football book, part love story. Uh, there's lots about my various relationships and trying to integrate women with football and how it doesn't always work. Um, and then it's also a love story about a man with his football team. And it's also sort of part stadium announcer's manual on how to be a stadium announcer. So there's some very worthy chapters on how to do the perfect minute silence. <laughs> what, what music to choose, <laughs> things not to say, because an an announcers are always getting sacked. You know, football every yeah. every uh, few weeks you'll hear a football announcer's been sacked. What's what's the closest you've come? Uh, I remember when Paolo Di Canio um, left the field at the end of a game. I'm not sure if you remember this one. And he, we all knew he was joining Manchester United on Monday because. Uh, the Champions League window was coming down and if he didn't join them he wouldn't be allowed in the Champions League and he waved to all four corners of the ground and he beat his heart and everyone sang Paolo Di Canio and I said let's hear it for Paolo one more time we might not see him again and uh, he played for us for another two seasons <laughs> and I got a letter from the club lawyer saying it's not my job to comment on transfer speculation mm. which is fair enough really wrists firmly slapped yeah but all I wanted to do was he was a legend and I couldn't bear to think that he yeah. would just suddenly wouldn't be there on Monday and we hadn't said goodbye so I did it with the very best intentions but uh, it was right I shouldn't have said that now, you've experienced quite a few managers over the years I mean West Ham were always a club that didn't really change their managers very often but that's that's certainly changed in the last 10 years mm. um who's been your favorite yeah so West Ham have had 14 managers in our history of over 100 years since uh, 1900 uh, we started 1895 as Thames Ironworks before anyone rings in and then in 1900 we changed our name and that's when we first had a manager because before it was a committee. So we've had 14 managers. I've worked for seven of them. My favourites would be Harry Redknapp, uh, Alan Kerbishley. Uh, and my least favourite would be Glenn Roder, Avram Grant. And Alan Pardew is a bit brilliant and a bit didn't like him at all. Why? Uh, because he he would always... He would always say things that made me look stupid in front of people. I remember one time at the end of a game, I um, announced that the district, uh, just about 10 minutes before the end, that there were problems on the district line. And for safety reasons, they said I should announce that in case people needed to get home. And, get home, and everyone left. <laughs> and he went mad. We won 3-0. <laughs> there was no one to clap them off the pitch, which is fair enough, actually. I think, he, I think he was right. But if he'd have just said it quietly to me, that would have been fine. But in a press conference afterwards, he went, can't believe it, 1-3-0, and there's no one here to cheer us because our announcer's more interested in the train timetables. And I just sat at the back of the conference thinking, oh, cheers, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how did you first get into it? I mean, you, you can't really go on a course to learn how to do it, can you? No, not really. Um, I, it was the summer of 1998. Uh, if you remember, England were at the World Cup and David Beckham got sent off against Argentina. Um, so that that's to put it in perspective. Uh, but just before all that happened, when the teams were heading off for the World Cup, uh, I got a phone call from West Ham saying, do you want to be the announcer? And I said no, because I liked being a season ticket holder in the West End. I liked shouting at the players, abuse and advice. And I imagined if you're the announcer, you're probably not allowed to do that. Um, so it was quite a good stress relief for me to be able to shout at them. And... Um, so I went in for a chat anyway about being the announcer and I still thought I'm not going to do it. And then they asked me again and I said no. And then eventually I had this dream that Rio Ferdinand was going to score the winning goal in the World Cup final. He was the West Ham player in the England squad. And that I would welcome him onto the pitch at the start of the new season as the man whose goal had won the World Cup for England in the same way as Jeff Hurst, Martin Peters and Bobby Moore had been welcomed at the start of the 66-67 season after. That, that, that was the season West Ham won the World Cup. West Ham won the World Cup for England. There were a few other players from other smaller teams involved but no one remembers them. And uh, I th I, in this dream I was going to do it. I had the dream, seriously, I had this dream three nights running and then I rang them up and said, OK, I will do it. You see, I find that almost difficult to believe because for most of the 30-odd thousand people sitting in the crowd, if they mm. got a phone call from West Ham saying, would you like to be the match day answer, most of them would bite, bite, the, bite the hands off. Yeah, but at the time, I was presenting uh, sports magazine programmes on Channel 5, so I had quite a good, good career going, and to not be available every Saturday afternoon would, mm. was not going to be very good for my career. You know, you can't say, oh, I'm a sports presenter, oh, I can't do Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> so that was going to be rough. But fortunately, I, I got axed from Channel 5 when my hair started falling out and it didn't <laughs> fit in with their young demographic. <laughs> so that was all lovely. Um, and so I, I did say yes to it. But it, it definitely has affected my broadcasting career because I'm not available whenever West Ham at home. So how do you prepare for a game? Uh, well, I, f I check all the names. All the, I mean, fortunately... 
there's always a, a silver lining to every cloud. Now we're in the championship, lots more British names, a lot easier to pronounce. There's not the big overseas signings when you play Doncaster <laughs> and teams like that that there are when you play Chelsea. Um, but if there are any, I don't know, then I'll find the press officer or someone from the other club and just say, how do I say this name? And I, I remember one, one year we were playing a, a team and I got three different pronunciations of the name from three different people in that team. And sometimes the opposition think it's a laugh to tell you, oh no, the goalkeeper's pronounced this way. Because then they'll, they'll laugh when you do it wrong. There's one player, I can't remember who it was now, from reading the book, that mm. sought you out to yes. oh, tell was, you his pronunciation. Yeah, it was in the second season I was there, and it was uh, Micah Hyde, who played for Watford. And I didn't know who it was, but this guy just came in in a Watford tracksuit at the back of the room, the announcer's room, and he said, oh, by the way, the number, whatever, for Watford is pronounced Micah Hyde. And I said, oh, thank you very much, mate. Um, I'll make a note of that, because it looked like it was Mika and it, it, all the commentators that season were calling Mika Hyde. And I said, oh, thanks for that. Who are you? He went, I'm Mika Hyde. <laughs> and it was him. And he, he ran off onto the pitch. Well, actually, if, you, if you're struggling with names, the place to ring is GCHQ. Uh, <laughs> if, if there's a football football player you can't pronounce, ring up because they've got, they've got people who speak every language in the world and they'll put you right straight away. So they so, probably have a hotline, actually, for, 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 for commentators and announcers. See, I, I've got visions of Mika Hyde appearing as sort of the, the Lebanese singer that uh, I quite like. You know Mika? No, no, no let's know. not let's not go there then. Do you know my knowledge of Lebanese music has gone right downhill? Well, he's actually British, but sort of part Lebanese. But oh, so it's very, very, very good. I shall, um, I recommend his albums. Um, so, <laughs> so you, you you learn how to pronounce the players. Yes. What what happens then? Uh, well, then I'll read them out. <laughs> <laughs> They'll walk out the tunnel, and I'll read their their team out very normally. But you have presumably got to whip the crowd up into a bit of a frenzy. No, not really. West Ham fans do not like to be whipped into a frenzy. They'll fold their... If I start telling them what to do, they'll fold their arms and go, yeah, we, we'll make up our own minds, thank you very much. What I think to be a good announcer, it, the better you are, the less you do, actually. And the worst announcers are the ones that love the sound of their own voice and they go... Wah, 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 wah. Mm. The, um, the uh, at Doncaster at the weekend, uh, I've heard so many people moaning about the Doncaster announcement at the start of the second half when he was trying to G up the Doncaster road fight. You know, they're, they're going to cheer their team. You don't need to go, let's hear it. Now, the thing is, because I've worked for seven different managers, I, in that time, have almost appeared to change personality each time I changed managers. Because Harry Redknapp would say, would send Frank Lampard Sr. over and say, don't get the crowd going, it puts pressure on the players. Alan Pardew would like all the razzmatazz and all mm. the play the music really, really loud. Get I'm forever blowing bubbles as they come out really loud. Pump it up, shout that, tell them to get behind the team. So of course I'd have to do that. Uh, and then when Alan Kirby came in, I toned it down a bit, and then he came to me and said, "Oh, you don't, they don't seem, you don't seem to be as excited." And I went, "No, because Alan Pardew used to make me do that. That's not <laughs> me at all." Oh well, just do it a little bit. And uh, yeah, yeah. If the, whatever the manager wants is what they get. Really. So basically, what you're telling us is that. The politics of football clubs is, is far worse than the politics of politics. Yes, oh, of course, yeah. No, well, there's not that much politics. Well, you're listening to the LBC Book Club with me, Ian Dale. Jeremy Nicholas is here. Richard J. Aldridge is here too. More of them in just a few minutes' time. This is LBC. It's 9.30. And you're listening to the LBC Book Club. I'm Ian Dale, and with me in the studio are Richard J. Aldrich, the author of GCHQ, The Uncensored Story of Britain's Most Secret Intelligence Agency, which I've been told to say is now available on the iBookstore. So there you go. And also, Jeremy Nicholas is here too. He's the author of Mr Moon Has Left the Stadium, Confessions of a Matchday Announcer. I've just realised I haven't actually asked you about Mr Moon, which I probably should have asked you first of all, Jeremy, but we're going to keep people on tenterhooks. As don't who Mr Moon is. Yeah, don't reveal it just yet. Can I, can I tease it a little bit? Tease it, go on. So, uh, so just for Richard, this is the tease for you. So all the time I've been a West Ham season ticket holder for years and years and years, about every third or fourth game there's an announcement saying, well, the stadium manager, please note, Mr Moon is in the stadium and everyone goes hey and he gets a massive cheer when he arrives and he's only usually there for about 10 minutes i don't yeah. think he really likes football he leaves and then it's announced mr moon has left the stadium and everyone cheers again and sometimes this can happen on multiple occasions yeah, during the same match yeah and no one really knows who mr moon is but mm. um jerry might or might not enlighten us in just a few minutes time um now uh, richard turning to you again on, on on your gchq book um is there anything too secret that you haven't put in the book, which I realise you, you you're not going to tell me. But <laughs> well, I, yes, I, tell I, us that now. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, but then I'll, of course we'll have to kill you. Yes. To, 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 I mean, it, 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 the, the the book had to be researched very carefully because I, I, I couldn't 
interview people who had signed the Official Secrets Act because, of course, then the book might have been banned and you could have got those people into trouble. Um, but, of course, digging through the millions of pages of material being released into the archives, occasionally you come across something and you think, crikey, you know, maybe that shouldn't be in the archives. And, th and there was an instance where... Um, one government department that regards its files as very, very boring indeed was, was, was releasing material for the 1990s, really quite, 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 quite recent stuff. And they, they, they had a copy of a report on how to prevent the assassination of members of parliament. There'd been a number of unfortunate assassinations in the 80s, people like Ian Gow. And, and I looked at that and I thought, hmm, um, not entirely sure that should just be lying around in the archives for any, um, budding trainee terrorist to come along and read. If you so that's pages 450 <laughs> to 500 in the book, is it? Well, I did actually think at that point <laughs> I, I, I ought to give someone in government a little nudge and say, well, actually, uh, I'm not sure that should be just laying around for, for anybody to read. And did you ever get a phone call from someone saying, I'm Richard, now I'm sure you're a jolly good chap, but of course we would quite like to see a manuscript before you publish the book? Yes, I did. I mean, we, Britain has a, an organisation called the, the D-Notice Committee, and, and when they discovered I was writing this book, I, I got a very polite phone call um, saying, uh, we're, we're a little bit worried about this. But, but because the book has been put together from um, open material, material that's been deliberately declassified by government, that they, they were reassured Mm. That, 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 that we'd respected the official. And I have to say, GCHQ were wonderful about the book. They they invited me down to Cheltenham for, for tea and government-issued chocolate biscuits, so so they've been absolutely great. Oh, That's no, what, what happened in that meeting? <laughs> uh, come on, you've got to reveal all. I think all. during that meeting, that is where they attached some kind of a bug to you. Because, <laughs> but you they must bug you, don't they? Just well, I, when I was researching the book, it wasn't GCHQ I was worried about. It was the Americans. The Americans do actually keep an eye on historians and journalists who are working in this area. So I wrote the book on a laptop that was disabled to prevent it from connecting to the internet so it's what we call an air gapped machine and i carried my mobile phone around in a lead lined box which i'm now glad i don't have to lug around because it was it was quite heavy i mean see that i find that sort of thing absolutely fascinating and and you're, you're confident that you weren't nothing was intercepted along the way well, we, 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 we don't know, but, but, but the book made it onto the book stand. So. Is, is there anything in your book that would be of an advantage to a foreign power? Well, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting question because in, because in a way... I can honestly say there's nothing in my book that would be of <laughs> any interest to a foreign power. In, in a way, any discussion of, of either work by human spies or, or listening sensitises your enemies. So even a book about Bletchley Park during the Second World War um, sensitises your opponents to the fact that they might be being listened in on. And actually, mm. what, a, what an organisation like GCHQ depends on is, is, is laxity and slackness and sloppiness by, by the enemy. You don't want to alert them to the fact that they're, they're being listened to. Um, moving on to the sort of 60s and 70s. Now, Harold Wilson had a bit of a tempestuous relationship with the, with the security services. Um, what, what do you say about him in the book? Well, I mean, H Harold Wilson is, is absolutely fascinating um he, he's a completely paranoid figure i mean we I, I i've spoken to people who worked closely with with harold wilson and and they've described again being in being in the toilets if you had to ha want to have a, have a serious conversation with harold wilson you had to go into the loo or the bathroom and turn the taps on because then he'd be convinced that he wasn't being bugged and the the people he was terrified of quite rightly actually were the south africans the intelligence service that he seemed to trust um most implicitly was 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 mossad um so so how wilson had an absolute and i'm sure there's more to come out about wilson wilson is a is a very fascinating figure now gchq has often been integral to the special relationship with the united states as it's often been used for spying on the en enemy doing many times in international conflicts i guess but what, what happened with edward heath and henry kissinger in the 70s well i mean r remarkably um nixon and kissinger were getting increasingly grumpy with edward heath because as we know edward heath was keen on europe and the common market and the french and everything and Edward Heath has this habit of ringing up the French first to discuss things rather than the Americans. And in the summer of 1973, K K Kissinger had, had had enough. He wanted to rattle the cage of the British. So he cut off the 
Anglo-American intelligence relationship. So um, he said, no more, no more signals intelligence, no more stuff from the CIA, no more secret imagery. But of course, two months later, he gets a chance to get his own back on the Americans because the Yom Kippur War break breaks out in the Middle East and the Americans need our bases, places like Cyprus, to fly their spy flights from. And he says no. And so this, this battle over intelligence goes on for for over a year. But what I've discovered since is this is a battle which is repeated. It's repeated in the 90s. John Major says, oh, the Americans would never would never cut off the intelligence relationship. But of course, people remember this episode. And, and of course, the Americans did in the 90s again. Um, and this has been replayed again in 2005, 2006 with the secret prisons mm. in Europe. The Germans have said... This secret prison stuff is, is is very dangerous. The Polish prime minister might have to go to prison. And at this point, it's the Germans threatening the Americans. This is the really interesting thing, actually. The Germans in 2005, 2006 said to the Americans, if you don't mend your ways, if you don't stop locking people in nasty dungeons and things, we're going to cut off our intelligence flow to you. And this is the boot on the other foot, because it's very odd to think of, a, you know, medium-sized American power cutting off. But, of course, the Americans desperately needed intelligence from Europe because they, they 9-11 was launched from Germany and any future attacks w were most likely to come from Europe. So the Americans could not do without intelligence. And the Germans were able to say, behave yourself or we'll cut you off. Now, what can you tell us about Margaret Thatcher's decision to sink the Belgrano during the Falklands War? Because presumably that was based on information, well, it's partly provided by GCHQ. Well, I, I, this is this is absolutely fascinating, and I, I think you know this is where Signals Intelligence gives us, if you like, a you know a, a clear insight into the what actually happens in international relations. And, and it's, it's it's clear that um, the British had intercepted a signal. Um, that suggested that the Belgrano was going to attack the British fleet. Um, permission was given to, to sink the Belgrano. We intercepted more information that said the Belgrano had turned around. But by the time that information was processed, um, the attack on the Belgrano was, was already taking place. So to some extent, it's, 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 it's kind of exonerated or, or removed some of the more... Um, exotic conspiracy theories around the Belgrano. But it's kind of introduced others because what we now know is that um, we were desperate to stop the Argentinians acquiring more Exocet missiles. They had a number of arms dealers running around Europe trying to buy more Exocet missiles. And um, the British had a, had a conversation with one of our European allies and our European allies reportedly um, liquidated some of these these arms dealers for us. Um, the French? Because uh, uh, actually the French were very helpful to us during the Falklands War, weren't they? You're, you're not a million miles away there. You're, you're, you're very warm. <laughs> in fact, you're red hot there. Um, and fascinatingly, this, this, this changes. I'm told this changed the way which Margaret Thatcher thought about the French. Yeah. Um, the French because Mitterrand always had a bit of a thing for it, didn't um, he? Indeed, uh, one can understand that, perhaps. Um, and um, but the French were fantastic allies during the the Falklands War, and actually, people say this changed Margaret Thatcher's view on the Channel Tunnel. Um, after their tremendous performance in the Falklands War, she said, "Fine, you can you can have your tunnel." <laughs> <laughs> but of course, in a sense, you you could say, well, the Falklands conflict was at demonstrated a failure of the intelligence services because no one saw it coming absolutely and it's 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 a classic failure where actually um you, you the, the 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 intelligence the, the joint intelligence committee which which you know is, is the highest level of intelligence analysis was asked to look at this question year on year on year and if you're asked to look at the same question again and again you'll tend to come up with the same answer um, and, and there's a kind of an inbuilt resistance to changing your mind because, you know, every six months or and, and it was one of those classic problems. Um, and it's one of the reasons that we were caught out then and will be caught out again in the future. And, and how has GCHQ adapted to the end of the Cold War? Because, I mean, OK, that was 20 years ago now. It doesn't seem that long ago, really. Um, but there are, there are very new challenges now, aren't there? There are. There are. And, and, and I, I think the, the biggest challenge is that, um, you know, during the Cold War, the majority of our time was spent listening in to, to certain very static opponents, the Russians, the Chinese, 
um, the Cubans, the Libyans, and now we have to listen into uh, and we have to listen into everything. And you never know where the the next crisis is going to break out. So, which languages do you recruit? Mm. You know, um, and, and it takes ten years to build up a really good. I mean, we, we, we I'll tell you what, if you're a Chinese and Arabic speaker, I bet you, I bet you get a job in so GCHQ could, could very job, easily. You? Just because yeah. we suddenly start getting on with the country and you think, well, oh, that's great, but I've lost my job mm. now because they don't need listening to. And, of, and, 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 of, and, 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 and of course, you just, you just don't know from week to week what, what obscure language. I mean, you know, Sierra Leone, who would have predicted that? Yeah. Richard, we'll talk to you a little more in just a few moments' time. Before we go to the travel, let me just tell you what Anthony Davis is going to be talking about tonight after 10. He's going to ask what you would like the National Service to include after all 16-year-olds. It was announced today will be called upon to do National Citizen Service as part of David Cameron's plans to fix Britain's broken society. And the search began today for 10,000 members of the public to take part in the London 2012 opening and closing ceremonies. What do you want to see from the opening and closing ceremonies? Ceremonies, and would Jeremy Nicholas like to commentate on it? I suppose that's something else we could ask. All that and more with Anthony Davis from ten o'clock. It's nine forty-five. And here's Alan Joyce with the LBC Travel. Thanks, Ian. Firstly, an update in Clapton tonight, where Lee Bridge Road. Now, let me give you the full details of uh, the books that we're talking about tonight, because I never leave enough time at the end of the programme to do that normally, so let me do it now. Richard J. Aldrich, GCHQ, The Uncensored Story of Britain's Most Secret Intelligence Agency, published by the Harper Press in paperback, 650 pages for 12 99 Jeremy Nicholas, Mr Moon Has Left the Stadium, Confessions of a Matchday Announcer, published by Biteback in paperback at 12 99 slightly fewer pages, but equally good, I would say, but then I would say that wouldn't I as I published it. Um, now, Jeremy, mm. um, internationals, you've, you've, com- you've announced at one or two or yes. d- or at West Ham. Are they, how are they different from a normal league match? Well, I remember my first season at West Ham. I'd only done three games and I got my international call-up and it was the England under-21s against Bulgaria. And someone from the FA handed me a CD and track two on the CD was the Bulgarian anthem and track ten was God Save the Queen. And the game was live on Sky, and I literally had to say, please welcome the players, announce them and everything, and then play the anthem. So I played the Bulgarian one, and then it was very, very tense as I had to click from track two to track ten, and I click, 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 click. Is that track ten? Is that track ten? Is it definitely track ten? Press play. And if I'd got it wrong, track nine was Deutschland, Deutschland, Uber Alice. <laughs> live on Sky, it would have been a nightmare, and I was so relieved when I heard our tune. But, uh, yeah. And um, so dedicated are you to all things West Ham hmm. that you actually got married at the ground. I did now, get some married. people might say that was a little bit sad. Well, you might think that. I don't, but, but uh, others might. Um, I married a very beautiful South African once, once we realised they weren't the enemy, as uh, <laughs> we were hearing there from Richard. And uh, a lot of our family were coming to London for the, for the wedding. And the great thing about West Ham, well, there's so many good things about West Ham, as you know, Ian, but we have. Uh, lots of hotel rooms built into the stand because all of the corporate boxes on a non-match day turn into a hotel room so all the family could stay at the hotel we could have the wedding in uh, it was actually in the Carlsberg I know the punchline to what's coming up do you? yeah you, s- you scored at Upton Park I did score at Upton Park because yeah. <laughs> I had my honeymoon there in, I mean. in suite 270 and I think I was probably <laughs> the only person to score in a West Ham shirt for about a month at the ground. But no, we had the wedding there, we had the reception there, we did a lap of honour around the pitch with all the <laughs> guests promenading behind, we went <laughs> clockwise for luck, it was marvellous, and then and we actually had the reception in the long, thin suite behind the goal, which is now Greenwood and Lyle, uh, which is completely the wrong shape for a wedding reception, but it was the only one that had a view of the pitch. And they went, oh, you don't want that, Jeremy, you want one of these nice big square but you ones. you see, Jeremy, I mean, having read the book, um, and I know that your um, wife... Mm. then girlfriend was not sort of a huge football fan she's maybe more into rugby rugby than fan football. she's a fan of the blue balls how on earth did you persuade her to have the most important day of her life in the green wooden lyle suite at west ham well because she'd been coming to games with me and uh i just said you know it's we didn't want to have too much planning it's a one-stop shop a lot of it was convenience wedding reception honeymoon everyone's staying they're all in the one place you know, usually when you have a wedding, it's at a church, and then you get on, go, got to go to the village hall, and then people have got to get taxis to the hotel. This is all in one place, a cathedral of football. That's how I sold it to her. 
True love, clearly. Um, <laughs> now, you, you also had an interesting experience in at Cardiff at the Millennium Stadium during one of the playoffs. Yes. Well, we went to Cardiff three years in a row. Um, we lost to Crystal Palace in the playoff final. I was there. Yeah. Then we won the next year against Preston I was there. to get promoted. And then the, f the following year, we went to uh, play Liverpool in the I FA Cup. Final. Yeah. Well, well done. Uh, you are a West Ham fan. You should have been there. But the middle season, when we played Preston, I was invited to go onto the pitch before the kickoff to get the crowd singing I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles. Well, just our end, not just the east mm. end, not the north end. Um, and I walked out onto the pitch with Herbie the Hammer and Bubbles the Bear. And Richard, these these are our mascots. Okay, so it's, it's basically it's a it's a <laughs> a woman uh, inside Bubbles the Is Bear. Is it really? It's a woman inside Bubbles the Bear. Yeah, and the uh, a, a young chap inside Herbie the Hammer, who is her son. And interestingly. She, Cause, because we are a family club. Yeah. Interestingly, she used to be inside Herbie the Hammer, and then he got too big to be in Bubbles the Bear, and so they swapped. So. That was this is the kind of information you get in Jeremy's book. I don't know, book. Richard, if your book goes into this kind of detail, but uh, this is this this is truly this is truly revelatory. It's yeah. as revelatory as any spy book. So Herbie the Hammer is basically a metallic-looking shiny hammer, and the thing is. Uh, that would be a little bit too scary for some of the younger children. So, that for, so for the younger ones, there's Bubbles, who's reassuringly furry and round and yellow. And they walked out onto the pitch with me to help me get the crowd going with I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles. We're walking onto the pitch, and this burly steward at Cardiff says, Stop what you're doing. You can't come on. You can come on, but they can't, not with those big feet. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, they would make less of an impression in the turf than you would have they done. That, that's feet. the logic I would use. Oh, because there was the, pre they, the they, pressure was more yeah, evenly distributed. Exactly, that's it. Pressure force I got over ungraded area. at physics O-level, but even I know that. You did well. You got the certificate. Uh, but no, they, apparently their feet were too big, and so they had to go off. Now, if you can imagine mascots being chucked off a pitch, they trooped off, heads down, arms by their sides, really milking it. The, the poor old steward was getting lots of stick from the West Ham fans, and I was left out there to talk to 85,000, I think, at the Millennium Stadium, with a mic friend scared stiff because i'd lost my mind as well there we go now what about the west ham players that you've encountered over your 14 years um have any of them left any impressions on you um well i suppose my favorite players um julian dix when i got to do his testimonial he's a fantastic bloke should have played for england very very skillful i know he had a reputation of being a hard man but he was brilliant down that left flank had a fantastic shot and he i did the testimonial for him and he rang me at home the next day and said thanks for doing that and i, I get ridiculously excited about any west ham player you know ringing me or talking to me mm. only last season i took my seat in the dugout and freddie sears was sat there and he went hello jeremy and i thought a west ham player knows my name <laughs> it's only freddie sears who's like 19 year old kid dude and thinking about it i've probably been the announcer all the time he's been a west ham fan so yeah. Uh, of course he would know my name, but I was just so ridiculously excited it, about It that. is pathetic, isn't it? I, rem I remember bit. I went to interview Tony Cotty once, yeah. and I just was completely tongue-tied. I couldn't really think of anything to ask him, apart from sort of saying we were so brilliant. I remember going to the Gants Hill Odeon uh, when I was a kid uh, to see Towering Inferno with Steve McQueen, so that would be about 75, I think, and I trod on the man's toe in the queue behind me, and I turned around to say sorry, and it was Bobby Moore and i could not speak to him i could not speak now my sister went to dance class with his daughter roberta at miss brill's dance academy somewhere in east london and and so she did chat to him but i honestly he was my all-time hero i had a little statue of him by the side of my bed i'd post his i couldn't mm. talk to the man it, it, it's very odd how people i mean you, you're in the media in broadcasting um but when you meet somebody who is your absolute hero, mm. you do tend to go slightly weak at the knees. I when I came in here today and I saw you, I wasn't sure if Thank I could actually much. do the interview. I, I, that happened to me when I met Cliff Richard, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> oh. I just couldn't think of anything. And I've got, this is going to be a terrible admission for you, Jeremy, but I have about 150 Cliff Richard CDs in my collection. I could not think of a single thing to say to the man. Right. And yet... He's been a very important part of my life. Uh, do you have any similar experiences, Richard? Yes, yes, I do. I do actually. I, I went to see a, a, a medical professional. I, I had a problem with my, my my back and my rear end, and and um, I wonder where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out he'd had a previous career um, planting bugs in Northern Ireland, and, and in fact, he he told me that he had the um, the privilege of planting the first bug under Jerry Adams's car. And it occurred to me that the hands that were massaging my buttocks at that very moment were, were the same hands that had put the first bug. And it, this was... The this, hands this, of history. 
this was a very peculiar experience, but, but, but a historical one, a historical one. And we thank you for sharing it with us, I, I think. Mm. Um, now, you were sacked, Jeremy, ha- by um, the old regime, the Icelandic the regime. regime. Yes, the Icelandic guys. Nothing to do with the people who are in charge now, who are marvellous people and all my friends, I must say that. But I got sacked after ten seasons in the job, the day before the season started, and, uh, and then was out for f- five months sitting on the touchline watching while well, three different announcers made a right pig's ear of it, kept playing I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles at the wrong time, wrong versions. And then eventually I returned in triumph on one January evening when we beat Hull City under floodlights, and it was fantastic. And I love it. I'm, I'm back now. And I'd better tell you what Mr Moon means, because otherwise you're going to run out ha- of time. That was my next question, next I promise. Question. Sorry, OK. Yes, what, what, who is Mr Moon? Because the title of the book is Mr Moon Has Left the Stadium. It's a, well, I can't tell you exactly what it means, but it's a coded message to the stewards that tells them that they need to do something, and then when, it's, when, when he leaves the stadium, it's, OK, you, you don't need to be doing it anymore. It's nothing to worry about. It's just an arbitrary name that they picked that they thought nobody in the ground would have. And it dates back to a, a, stu- uh, a steward who worked there years ago who was called Dickon Moon. It's a Cornish name, Dickon Moon. And uh, they said, we need a name that communicates a message to the stewards without scaring anybody. And uh, they said, well, I bet there's nobody in the ground called Moon. Because if it was Mr Smith, about half the people would be going, what, what was that? What was that? <laughs> but they, the, but the thing out. is, why don't other clubs do this? I mean, I've never heard anything like this at, at another club. Other clubs do have it, but they, they just don't get the accolade and the reception that Mr Moon is, you know, they don't get applauded on their own. And that's just because West Ham fans are a little bit different and like a bit of a laugh. Well, Jeremy, thank you very much indeed for joining Pleasure. us on the programme. And Richard also. Richard Aldrich, GCHQ, twelve ninety nine in paperback. Mr Moon has left the stadium exactly the same. I'll be back tomorrow at seven. Meanwhile, Anthony Davis is coming up next. This is LBC 97.3. See the best football teams. 